we are topping the whole week with um, having the opportunity to celebrate the guys. We say guys behind the behind the whole HISP and the DHS2 movement, and that is Jörn and Arthur, and they actually get uh, becoming 70 years old. Hi, Iranga. <laughs> Um, 70 years old, actually, in just a month in between them. And that's very typical because we remember when they came to our family and they even look a little bit similar. <laughs> and they have a long history together. So we will actually use this opportunity and we got Kalle to come, we got Nora to come, and they are the team from the very, 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 very beginning in 1994, when it started as a post apartheid project. So we, we all are looking forward to this start of the party which is actually looking backwards and listening in to all the gossip and the stories, things we haven't heard before, and you are allowed to ask questions. Every question is fine. Uh, and we also have a, a Google Doc with questions from the HISP week, but then they haven't seen it. But we, I know that Arthur is the one with the plan, so he will start the whole thing, talking a little bit. Oh, well, Jörn will start. You can say that. <laughs> so Arthur, you just said you're a new start. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can say that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody. This is a kind of typical chaotic anarchical HISP thing. Uh, the only reason that HISP has succeeded for the last 25 years, because we have no plan, there is no fixed agenda, <laughs> we just do it following our instincts and following the needs of the people that we're working with. Is it too loud? No, no, I'm saying I don't want to listen, you don't have plans. Oh, well, no, no, no. well, we have lots of plans, but no f nothing well, we fixed. Don't like that one. Everything <laughs> flexible. <laughs> that I, was before it comes. I, I think if I was to describe HISP in, from my perspective, it's a bunch of anarchists working together in a common direction which is quite an achievement. And the, <clears throat> the chief architect of the anarchy are sitting before you here, led by Jorn with his old trade union habits. <laughs> Kale, <laughs> the reprobate. <laughs> and Nora who keeps us all together. <laughs> but this was originally a Norwegian project, and so I'm going to hand over to Joran yeah. to tell a little bit about where Norway comes from. You might not know it, but yeah, no, that's uh, it started because I got uh, my scholarship uh, for a PhD, and I was uh, searching the world for uh, appropriate places to do my field work, which uh, I wanted to do in Africa or even Mongolia or wherever, and find ways to use what was then the modern uh, technologies in a way to, uh, to do, empower those who previously have not been able to apply these technologies before. So that was the idea and I went many many places and Mongolia I mentioned and I can also mention that uh, we had a full-fledged proposal in Tanzania to develop a district-based information system but then uh, fortunately that was turned down by uh, Ola's uh, mother-in-law in fact <laughs> who uh, resided uh, at the embassy and declared that Africa was not uh, uh, yet uh, able to apply modern technologies like uh, computers and that kind of stuff. <laughs> and another story from that day was that it was, they were not even able to apply modern road work because they would drive too fast and kill each other. So that's a bit uh, maybe of the same, <laughs> same uh, storyline, but then after Mongolia and many other places, then uh, we got a good contact in the Norwegian Foreign Department, Arne, Ooh. and, <laughs> and uh, they were dealing with uh, 
with with the ANC and and, uh, and the South Africa, and that was before, of course, then Mandela had uh, come into power. So it was dealt by a special kind of secret office in, in the Norwegian Foreign Department. And the foreign uh, minister has told uh, how he went to South Africa with a lot of cash on his body and <laughs> distributed around. And so we hope that he would continue that practice also with us. <laughs> and, uh, yes, to some extent. And uh, I just found a, a letter Arne wrote to us that, yes, we have got your funding for uh, a visit to South Africa. And that's why, that's why we actually managed to come around and I met uh, Olive, uh, Sh Olive Shishana, who was then health minister in the kind of... Uh, Shadow. Yeah, the, the, in, in, the, in what was then the ANC's uh, health department and before the takeover of, of power. So that was some of the background. And I, <laughs> I just discussed with Carl and I can mention uh, one other important uh, a arbitrary meeting with uh, a representative from, from the Norwegian Foreign Department, which uh, resulted in Kalle sitting here, <laughs> 30 years later or whatever. And that was uh, at some flight somewhere. I met somebody who had been on a party with Kalle in Uganda the day before. And he told me that Kalle had got some scholarship or something, or uh, planned, yes, yeah, scholarship, and wanted to do a PhD in, in, in Africa. And then I contacted Kalle and said, why not come to South Africa? Because we were already there then. So that was, that was actually <laughs> the second strange meeting with, with uh, the Norwegian Foreign Department that uh, led to where we are. And then we started in, uh, yeah, we had a promise from Arne down there. And his uh, office was that we should get uh, a project funding for a district-based information system. But while things took time and it was 94 and this was in March 1994 20, and then as many will know then uh, the new government came into power in April and Arne's office or the foreign department which is kind of a I think you would call it a bilateral kind of organization to, to deal with South Africa. They disappeared and it was taken over by NORAD and the foreign department generally. So suddenly we had to start from scratch on the That's funding. Normal. But we had a promise <laughs> and they dragged their feet for one year and then they said, okay, we give you funding if you can prove that this is part of RDP. That's the Reconstruction and Development Program, and we want it in writing and with signatures from the top. Otherwise known as rumors, dreams, and promises. <laughs> yeah. There is a lot of rumors and a lot of promises at that time. And even uh, starting a Shibin was actually RDP, so that was uh, how it was. But then, at one point, uh, our friends in the Western Cape ANC actually managed to get a letter signed by the top office that yes indeed this is part of RDP and I heard that uh, uh, what is what is name again I, one of our friends there and said that yeah I mean he, he's even having his family here why don't you sign <laughs> yeah. yeah so then he signed so that was uh, how we got funding for what was then his with two P's. That was PP, that was pilot project. Only later uh, did it become a project or program, sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> so yeah, then, but now I've been talking too much. Uh, Arthur, you have a plan? Well, my I mean, uh, then I uh, just saying one more <laughs> thing just to leading up to, to what's happening, and that was that. In South, South Africa, in the, in the spring, uh, Nord Nordic spring of, of 94, we were there and uh, I was at UCT, Arthur was at UWC, and then they had a committee at uh, Western Cape for the RDP and for the health uh, reconstruction program. And I was representing University of Cape Town, Arthur was representing University of Western Cape, and then we had a meeting and we met. And I remember one thing from that uh, meeting, 
or from the, from the break. Arthur said, let's have a beer. Beer? I mean, it's lunch. Yeah, what, what, what's wrong with that? Yeah. <laughs> One of, one of many beers we've shared. Oh yeah, that's a oh. problem with the, with you sitting in front of the this one. So All right. Maybe me, you know, remember oh. I'm the technical guy. So okay. You need All right. To stand up, sit over here. Sorry, Arthur. Yeah. It will be like this. this also. Okay. All right. Um, as some of you know, I'm a South African. I left South Africa to cut a long story short, in 1976 to avoid going to the army. And I went back to South Africa in 1994 to go and rah, rah, rah the Mandela government and see whether I could contribute something. And I went to, <clears throat> I got a job as an academic, which is not my first love, but at the University of the Western Cape, which was a so-called colored university. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we were looking for some kind of social relevance for the university. Somewhere, it was a brand new public health program, and we didn't have any way to teach our students. So we thought, well, let's start in the district in which the university is located and help the newly formed district management team to manage the district. So I went to them, met them, and said, how can we help? We said, we don't know what the hell is going on in our district. So what do you mean you don't know what's going on? And we discovered, well, we did a bit of research, to, and there were 14 different organizations working in one district. There was the Colored Affairs, there was the prov Provincial Hospital, there was the Regional Services, 14 different, all collecting data out of the district. So we sat down and said, well, <coughs> what, how can we help you? And we just said, every single report that goes out of the district must also come back in to the district health management team. And we organized this and after lots of negotiations we finally organized everything to be photocopied and then we had this wonderful thing called Lotus 1, 2, 3 and we, I'd been using it, I'd learned about this in, in Benin and Ghana and we put it all into Lotus 1, 2, 3 and we proudly had six months of data for the district based on what was already being collected. I'm really happy with this. Then this funny man came in to have his eyes done. <laughs> and he had laser surgery to his eyes. He opened his eyes and saw for the first time without glasses, <laughs> looked at my Excel spreadsheets and said, I won't say what he said, but Arthur, have you never heard of referential integrity? This isn't a health information system. This is a bunch of hacked spreadsheets. <laughs> or some words to that effect. And I said, well, okay, I don't know anything, but can you make us a database? That's what he said, what he said was the solution. And that how it is how DHS 1 <laughs> was started. Kale coming out and looking at this, what we thought was wonderful, and saying <coughs> it won't work, he started this whole strange concept of free open source software. I'd never heard of it before. <laughs> the two of them introduced the Norwegian participatory design to the process, actually involving and speaking to the people in the district and, well, the rest is history, I think. Hmm? We had to break a lot of rules in order to get his going. One of them, a small one, was the Norwegians who thought we were supporting local government <laughs> when we were, in fact, supporting health. And Norwegians didn't support health in those days anyway. <laughs> 
But there were also within within the um, within the provincial administration, there was a, a lot of objection to this breaking down of the barriers of yeah just an amazing amount of pointless bureaucracy related to apartheid and that was i mean that was the incredible thing to follow what happened we, we did a little test we tried to follow what happened to the data that was actually collected these 14 different reporting streams and i think every single one of them landed in a rubbish bin somewhere or in a filing cabinet which is the same thing it just disappeared people spent lots and lots of time working on this and they saw absolutely no results and those early days we had some basic principles on which we worked and i think what is held through the years is this concept of listening to the user huh? and DHAS, well, HISP has always tried to listen to the user, and I think that is why we've continued to spread. Not through no fault of our own, just because what we had was, you know, we used to have this, in the land of the blind, one eye is king. And we gave people a little bit of information that was useful to them because we li were listening to what they wanted. And I think that is how we have moved on. Kalia. So then, uh, Nora, yeah. where Nora, are you? Where um, you're talking about Cal, you know. All right. There's a female well, in the room uh, as well. So this is the first history. No, let, let me introduce uh, Nora, yeah, Nora, because please. what was it in the... <laughs> Uh, the regional office, uh, the Western Cape yeah. regional office, that was, we had three was pilots, <laughs> three pilots, but uh, that was in districts that were not yet official. And when the DHIS uh, version 1 came around, and we have uh, minimum data sets and all that, actually the pilot district did not really have impact, but then we got the impact through NORA because uh, there's something called the regional council where everything that was uh, yeah, more, more or less not fully white uh, were kind of collected in the Western Cape whether you were black or whatever uh, colored and Indian and whatever that sorted under the regional council because apartheid was not abolished overnight you had all the structures Still. And, but one of the structures were <laughs> governed by Nora, then, so that's fine. <laughs> and they implemented the DHIS. And yes, the, that's where the rest is yeah. history, I think. Yeah. So now, Nora, <laughs> thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, what do I say? My name is Nora Stoops, and by profession, I'm a nurse. And my job description in the new provincial government after the change was epidemiology and public health. And I basically got the job because my boss knew I could work a computer. Wrong reason, but that's it. And part of my job description was to work with the his double P team. That was my job description in the government. So I was I then became completely involved in what was this his team doing and identified myself with as part of this team because I understood what the vision was. The other thing, I mean, not necessarily known, but is that South Africa was desperate for change. I mean, Arthur and you speak of bureaucracy, but people wanted something new and this new way of counting um, and not looking at race and looking at why you came attracted people because it made sense. And that was part of why it could expand because people immediately understood what we were aiming at. So <clears throat> I became a gopher. Uh, I helped organize things. I sorted out things and then as his progressed, I did uh, the bulk 
No, Cohen started with the teaching and I sort of crept behind him and I did the bulk of the teaching and the traveling and the training and things like that. So I became intimately involved in what was going on. Color, stand up and be counted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm the youngest of these museum pieces, so I don't need a microphone, as always. Sorry. That's fine. I, can't, I don't like microphones. <laughs> no, uh, you know, Jörn pointed out one thing. A friend of mine from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he was nursing his hangover on a flight from London after one of my big parties in Kampala. I was doing a vegetation mapping of the whole of Uganda in the early 90s. And uh, he just mentioned to Jörn that I had planned to go to South Africa to do a PhD on designing information systems for land reform. Nothing to do with health. <laughs> and then Jörn contacted me and I said, yeah, I can help out a little bit. He said he needed somebody who's technological strong, good to communicate, you know, putting them on the path because they were basically adrift at the time. Up shit creek without a paddle, as we usually call it in English. And um, I ended up, instead of spending three months, I ended up spending 25 years <laughs> with, uh, with uh, this bunch. And no plan. You can... <laughs> a little bit of planning, but I think for most of you, right, hearing some of the single stories and uh, the tidbits from those days is maybe not so interesting. What is more interesting is why actually have we survived? Because I think all of you know tons of even free and open source software projects, right, that has started up and sort of flared up, become seemingly big and then they die again, right? So what are the reasons that the his community has actually flourished over these 25 years? And I think there are several. The first is that the technology we, we chose and which we developed initially was suitable for, at that time, South Africa and later neighboring countries. And I can tell you, when we started, it, the first version of DHIS took about one and a half months to set up. And during that time, I had a friend of mine, my internet service provider actually, who came and said, hey, why don't you use, you know, some internet-based software, web-based software instead. This was all new and fancy. And I said, listen, only 4%, only 4% of the provincial health employees even have email. A good friend of mine who was in charge of a hospital, originally a Swedish guy actually, applied to the provincial government for a 15-inch monitor so he could do some GIS analysis and some mapping. And he was turned down and told that you're trying to build an empire. <laughs> so at those days, you know, asking for anything better than the old computers the provincial government guys themselves had was just not on. So we basically chose then the software, initially it was Microsoft Office, that people were already having on their computers, that they were used to, and I think that was a crucial part of it, right? It's because I hear, even these days, I hear people come and say, ah, DHS2, Java, old technology, it looks like something coming out of the 90s, blah, 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 and there might be some truth to that. But again, I would rather have some old Land Rover that actually works on African roads instead of a brand new Tesla that runs out of juice as soon as you're halfway out in the bush, right? So again, it is very much about having technology that fits the environment. I think the second aspect is that we have been building a community. And people often ask me, so you've been in charge of DHIS development for the first 15 years, so this was all your ideas. And I say no. 90% of the design and the, the ideas and the issues and the solutions going into DHS has been coming from users, coming from the communities. So our role was much more to sort of channel that, to say, well, this can't be done relatively easily. This is doable but difficult, and this one, you know, you've got to wait. 10 years. So it was very much more of a role of sort of managing a large group and then build that community. And <clears throat> I know a lot of you, I've seen a lot of you before, I see a lot of new faces too, and again I think that's been typical of this community. It's a community where people like, they stay, 
right? We, we South Africa too, we hardly had turnover, mm. right? 100 people and you know, 70 of them have been with us for years and years and years. So again, it shows that that community has been working for a large group of people. And the third one, and this might be a bit more controversial, I've never been happy with the amount of support we've had from Norwegian authorities, to be honest. In fact, my opinion is by far the best, uh, call it donors or, or you know, providers of support has actually been the Americans. Without support from a large equity project from 1999 to 2002, we would never have, we would have died after the initial his project. Because Nora just said, sorry, we're not supporting health in South Africa. And later also CDC particularly. And I mean, for those who are interested in research, I think it's an interesting research topic. Why have this community actually been very successful in working together with, for instance, CDC and other major donors, right? In a way, yes, it's, it's a thorny path sometimes and we fight and we're having issues, but generally, right, it has been working. And they have overall been relatively happy with us. And I think one reason why many American similar organizations have been battling with that is that they have tended to be too, shall we say, selfish because I know a lot of US organizations that developed also relatively sophisticated software for health. But they always ended up holding the source code to themselves because they saw it as a way of getting new projects, etc. So again, the openness of this community, I think, has been vital for ensuring that it continues for so long. Well, that was enough sort of broad philosophical <laughs> perspectives uh, on this. I don't know whether there's any much more to say except that uh, I reiterate what Jörn was saying also about being, or an author, about being anarchist. I wouldn't really say that. I would rather say we are kind of 24-7 type of people, right? <laughs> and I'm still getting phone calls and Skype messages and Telegram messages and Microsoft Team messages and, and all the other platforms that we're trying to track now. I'm still getting those messages coming in at midnight then. 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. and people are sitting somewhere and they need assistance with something. And you try to help. And again, that is part of that community spirit. There's something I didn't really mention, which I think it's important to realize too, right? All of us who started were basically long-term political activists. Arthur was chased out of the country and he got fired from his first job after three weeks because he went to the newspapers and told them that his hospital were chasing black kids away. He was working at the Red Cross Children's Hospital. So he got fired because, you know, one couldn't say these kind of things. And he ended up going in exile. Jörn is an old activist. I've been a political activist since I was 11. So all of us <laughs> came in. No, but I, it's just important to see that too. That's not what drives the community over 25 years. But it was critical to understand that the core team here, right, we were not in this for the money. We were not in this as some kind of a, you, you know, a developing country fling, right, go to Africa and see some, some elephants and, and then do something for health. We were all developmental <laughs> activists. And that means you're a stubborn bastard and you continue working. I had, for two years, I didn't get paid anything. Actually, the first five years too, I was living <laughs> off my my doctoral PhD, fellow, PhD fellowship. PhD yes, I, I had a doctor fellowship from the Norwegian <laughs> Research, uh, and I'm still busy with that uh, PhD. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> just, just ask. Don't ask me details about my progress. It's so, all. Uh, but the, the point is that. As an American sociology professor that I met 15 years ago in New York, you know, he sort of listened to a bit of my, my story and he said afterwards, Can so why have you guys been successful? Is it because of the products you're yeah, producing yeah, but, you know, or is it because of you? Uh, and he meant then the whole the group. And I yeah, basically yeah. said yeah. it definitely both because you can have a fantastic product if you don't have a team of people <coughs> building a community, it will just get lost, right? Or you can have a great group of people who is just sitting in endless workshops and talking and talking and actually not providing the, the, the tools that people can use and again, it dies. So it's a mix of things and I know it's the same for most of you. I know so many of you, right? And the work you've done in the countries and it's largely been a similar kind of process. You need some champions 
you need to have some products, but you also need to build that community, right? And, and get that sort of community feeling and that long-term commitment. Now we can, I, want, I want to tell just now we can one, one, one story very quickly <laughs> about our first interaction with this East, West Eastern Cape province. I was invited by a... Maybe this you should use this because they're actually okay. in All right. tape recording this. All right. um, <laughs> I, I was invited by a district manager to come and have a look at his information system. So we spent, I think, a week going through the... We put every single form they had to put. It was called the brown paper exercise. We put all the forms up on the wall. Mother and child health here, HIV there, TB, ta -ta -ta, the whole room was filled with the forms. And we looked at the forms and said, there's duplication and this, do we actually need the thing? So we came down, we had a data set of, I think, 60 or 80 data elements. And we made a data collection form that would collect everything that the district wanted for their use. Fine, we've got this. What are we going to do now? And I came up with the idea we're going to do nothing. We're not going to tell anybody for the, until we get feedback from the provincial office. We are not going to send any data. We waited six months <laughs> before the provincial office finally realized that we were not sending data out. <laughs> and eventually the lady from family planning, Ronell, who still works for HISP, she was the pr provincial information officer. She said, hey, where's my data? I said, oh, you, you, <laughs> that's nice that you've actually worked on that, that we haven't sent you family planning data. What would you like to know? We can give you analysis of your family planning by type, by age, by long-acting, short-acting family planning. We've got all the information here. But you didn't send it to us. We didn't send it to you because we never get feedback. She climbed into her little car and came driving down to Berkeley East and saw that all the nurses, the entire district health management team, knew about everything because they had done their own analysis of their own data in their own place. They hadn't bothered with this bloody province. They knew what was going on and that was what was important. Next week we had a cavalcade of the provincial information officer and the whole team and all the programs and <clears throat> we and that was what John Rohde heard about this he also came and that was when he asked us well after that he asked, that was why he was invited to our closing down ceremony <laughs> and that was how he started funding a new province uh, and just, uh, just before all these things I did, you, no, no? the two people involved Still Jenny work, Brown, yeah. Jenny and Renell still work for his today. Yeah. So, I mean, that also, this was 1990s. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think this was 1997, right? So, we were making waves already before we had gone to the province. I just wanted to say something about the technology we were using at that time. Now we have a web based approach, uh, one central server, and you change something, and everybody get it. At that time, Kalle was sitting in his, uh, his, his house in, in, uh, in, uh, in uh, was it Rosebank or wherever it was at that time uh, in Cape Town. And I remember when we were actually out in uh, the first implementation con uh, uh, province-wide in Eastern Cape, we had to implement, uh, they came, uh, five regions in, in Eastern Cape, they came with their computers and we installed and we trained. And then Carl said, ah, th then we reported bugs, and Carl said, okay, okay, I changed, I added the table. You have added the table. And then <laughs> you have to change the table, change in all the installations that in, during the training and all that. So that was how it was at that time. And I remember also we were in Umtata and had a training and we couldn't install because we were in the 10th or 6th or whatever floor. And it was an old building and then we put, uh, I mean, the, the CD writer on, on the CD reader on the floor. 
the kind of the baton there, and then it worked. <laughs> so, yeah, that was how it was at that time. <laughs> Nora, you had something? This is very personal. Working with his learning about information systems, working with people like Arthur, Yawn and Color is the best thing that has ever happened to me in my life. I did my a master's. I did a master's in public health. Arthur was my um, interviewed me for the wanting to do the course, and from there I almost want to say the rest is history. And it's the best ride ever. And I just can't say how much this work means to me. Thank you. Aww.